Ladies and gentlemen, the event is about to begin. Rhonda, please start. Hello, everyone. I'm Rhonda Major, Vice President, Global Head of Sales at Thompson CompuMark, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Protecting IP in Virtual World. A few reminders before we begin. First, our, our webinar today is designed to be a discussion involving you. Please ask any questions of the presenters at any time by typing a question into the questions box on your screen. Please note that your questions will be, remain anonymous, and we will address as many questions as we can during the Q&A session at the end of today's program. Also, should you experience any technical difficulties during the session and need assistance, please send us a message through the chat box and we'll assist as we can. During today's one-hour event, you will learn from our speakers as they share their insights and strategies on identifying the challenges virtual worlds can create for IP owners, understanding the legal implications of intellectual property rights in virtual worlds, and understanding the differences between legal rights in the real world and virtual worlds. A copy of the slides is available for download on the event information page using the password virtual. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Joining us is Po Yi, a partner in Venable's nationally recognized advertising and marketing group and based in the New York office. Poe's practice focuses on digital media, branded entertainment, advertising and marketing, intellectual property licensing, and sponsorships in sports, music, and film, both in transactional matters as well as regulatory, intellectual property, and general counseling and compliance. She edits the firm's Digital Media Link newsletter and has been speaking and writing on digital content and virtual reality issues. Also joining us is Justin Pierce, whose practice covers a wide range of intellectual property matters, including patent litigation, trademarks and brand protection, anti-counterfeiting, copyrights, design rights, trade secrets, licensing, rights of publicity, domain name and social media disputes, and international government affairs work relating to intellectual property matters. Outside of work, he is an inventor with a patent and published applications dealing with mobile applications, augmented and virtual reality, gaming, and anti-counterfeiting technology. Justin is based in Venable's DC office. Also joining is Linda Zirkelbach, who is also a resident in Venable's DC office. Linda counsels clients on complex copyright and trademark issues. She also litigates in the areas of copyright, trademarks, false advertising and domain names, and negotiates IP and publishing agreements. As a litigator, she has represented clients in federal courts across the country, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, and the U.S. Copyright Office. She has particularly deep experience in digital and online infringement and anti-piracy, with significant experience in complex BMCA issues, as well as in anti-counterfeiting. Welcome to all our speakers. We are thrilled to have you join us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Poe. Good morning, everyone. We're delighted to be here to talk about this very increasingly important topic, virtual reality. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just go through the topics we're going to be discussing today. There are a lot of different issues relating to virtual reality, but the focus of this panel will really be on IP issues, patents, copyright, trademark, right of publicity, uh, and we're going to go through some case studies to uh, to apply the existing laws of IP um, as it relates to, uh, to virtual reality. So the first thing that we want to talk about is why are we talking about virtual reality now? It's not like virtual reality has not existed for the past several decades. In fact, I think 
before, it was more, I think the mainstream idea of virtual reality was mostly taken from science fiction books and movies. We all know about the matrix, um, but there, there have been companies that have created VR experiences, VR platforms, but until now, I would say that most, most people, the, the general public, not really thought about virtual reality as being relevant to them. The time has come today where virtual reality is becoming a pretty mainstream topic. I think it's difficult to go to any digital focused conference without thinking about, without talking about virtual reality. As, we, as you may have seen, um, the August issue of Time Magazine actually had a cover story on virtual reality. And there was a very lengthy article describing the landscape of virtual reality. So with that, what we would like to do is start with um, talking about key terms and then go through uh, the, the, the basics of IP issues. And, and Justin will we'll start talking about that. Justin? Great. Thank you, Bo. I appreciate the uh, intro, and uh, thanks uh, for everyone for joining this morning. Some of the key definitions that I think are very important to address when you talk about issues like virtual reality are some that you see, of course, here on the slides. And I think this is important because a lot of people in terms of the technology uh, tend to mix and match terms. So to make things clear here, virtual reality as we define it and talk about it today uh, is really keys on any sort of immersive 3D or three-dimensional computer-generated environment that can be explored or, uh, by a person or viewed from a first-person scenario. Um, while there are a lot of different virtual worlds out there, that's sort of the key component or the common denominator between all the various different virtual worlds, uh, whether it's something you're engaging in on a PC or whether you're stepping into something where you're inside of equipment and it's simulating an entire 360-degree experience around you, where different technology may even recreate sounds, uh, smells, uh, various feels from haptics or various other devices and things like that. That is distinct and different from augmented reality, called AR, which is generally some sort of live, direct, or indirect view of the physical or real-world environment you're in, where elements of that real-world environment that you're viewing or experiencing are somehow enhanced or supplemented uh, by computer-generated input. This can happen in a variety of audiovisual means, whether it's sound, video, graphics, or even GPS data overlaid on a scene that you're viewing through a viewer. Uh, pilots uh, often have this type of technology overlaid through heads-up displays. Uh, there are cars, for example, now when you're looking through the windshield where you can get different readings that are right there viewable in your windshield. And then probably one of the most popular that a lot of people have experienced now for a few years and probably haven't even noticed it in many cases is when you watch, you know, we're in the midst of uh, professional football season now, but if you take a look at any professional football game uh, being televised on TV, the first down line or the line that uh, shows the so-called red zone that's being shown in your screen is not actually a painted yellow or red line on the football field, but it's being shown or overlaid on your view of that televised viewing of the uh, football field. And last but not least, if we say RR, real reality, we're talking about real life. So to get in some of the basics here, uh, Pogue started off great with kind of talking about all the different buckets of IP. I'm going to speak generally here for a few minutes about uh, patent law and some of the basics of patent law and how that will impact eventually, as we get into the presentation further, um, virtual reality. So patents is one of the distinct areas of intellectual property are that set of rights that govern, uh, that you're given sort of as a monopoly over a period of time that covers uh, technology or some solution, some inventive solution to a technical problem in the form of a new product, method of manufacture, process, uh, some chemical composition or, or, or examples of that. Generally in the U.S. and around the world, quite frankly, a patent application of some sort must be filed, and that patent application has to, in it, provide various uh, claims that define, you know, the meets and bounds of that intellectual property or a patent. 
you generally cannot get a patent unless it's novel, unless it's not obvious, and that it's new and useful. Patents are powerful, and as you can imagine in the world that uh, we have uh, talked about here with virtual reality and the technology behind it, it gives the patent owner the ability to stop others from commercially making, using, or selling, or distributing anything that would be covered uh, by that patented invention without permission. An important distinction to bring up here when we talk about patents, there's different types of patents, but primarily uh, the patents that concern here today are utility and in some cases design patents. Uh, just a quick word on that, utility patents quite simply cover the way something operates uh, or the way something may function. Uh, that typically covers different types of apparatus, devices, processes, chemical compounds, whereas a design patent, on the other hand, covers the unique way or distinctive way that an object or a useful article may look. Uh, it covers the look and feel uh, of a particular article. It's important to note, though, with design patents, it does not cover functional aspects. It doesn't cover, for instance, uh, something that's not ornamental and that's integral to the use of that particular, ob of that particular object or article. Move to the next. Before we get into theories of liability, just a quick word here as, as to why this is important, and particularly in the world of virtual reality. With today's current market and where the technology is at, and this kind of dovetails into the conversation that Poe started with how important it is to look at where VR technology is going, because we do have this convergence of technologies. I think it's important to understand patent law and the implications of it when it comes to virtual reality because you really do have uh, a time period now in history where we've got all the right factors, sort of a perfect storm. You've got uh, internet connectivity has increased, uh, broadband is, uh, or high speed internet connectivity is something that is available to a lot of companies and individuals, storage media, and video multimedia capabilities are at a high level. And when you combine that with the ability to project and render three-dimensional images to people on top of the world we live in where gaming is already at a pretty uh, high level, you can imagine the amount of uh, innovation this type of scenario causes. And as a result, there are a lot of companies who are already big players, whether it's on the entertainment end of multimedia and software development, uh, whether people who are developing things for training in various applications where you create simulated scenarios to do rehearsals or, or any type of practicing or training or educational scenarios, you've got a scenario that's really ripe for a lot of companies, whether it's startups and whether it's big players, to start asserting their rights and ownership over various aspects of whatever they do, whether it's on the entertaining or even on the educational side, through means of virtual training, and creating virtual environments, whether it's for the entertainment or educational purposes. So with that as a backdrop, I just want to cover a few of the basic points of where uh, theories of liability in terms of patent law will come to play. First of all, quite simply, there's direct infringement. Direct infringement uh, is where you basically have an accused infringer practicing each element of a patent holder's patent claim, either literally or through what's called the doctrine of equivalence, which I'll get into in a little bit here. In order for someone to be held liable for direct infringement, either they have to be making, using, or offering to sell uh, that patent, patented invention, uh, and they've also, or they have to be importing it. Direct infringement, this is an important point, is a strict liability offense. So in a sense, it really means that the infringer or the person accused of infringement doesn't have to know about or be informed about or aware of that particular patent in order to be held liable for infringement. Direct infringement now can be contrasted with indirect infringement. Uh, some may be say terms like contributory infringement or inducement of infringement. That's a scenario where the accused infringer may not practice each and every element of the patent holder's claim, but contributes in some way to the direct infringement by another party or induces another party to engage in the direct infringement. A key point here, though, is a party can only be liable for indirect infringement if another party is a direct infringer. 
And so earlier I talked about the doctrine of equivalence. This is important and particularly in an interesting sense when it comes to virtual reality because in some cases as the technology has developed and some of the applications we've even looked at just in the earlier slides, you may have a plaintiff or a patent owner that sees a particular infringer replicating a virtual environment that may be very similar to that covered in their particular set of patent claims that they want to assert. But maybe one particular element is not there, let's say, in a physical, physical sense, but you may have various other ways because of all the different types of technologies to substitute or create the same function or same effect uh, for players or users. And that type of, of uh, nuance, I think, is going to be an important issue uh, in times where parties, whether it's plaintiffs or defendants in the future, have to assess you know, how strong and how valid claims are being asserted against them. So with that, I'd like to move forward and turn this over to Linda, where she's going to speak more in depth about copyrights. Thank you, Justin. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. I am going to start with copyrights and then go into trademarks immediately after that. Um, some of you may know that copyrights are is an IP right for an original work of authorship that's uh, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Um, copyrights don't protect facts or ideas. Um, which often are, you know, somewhat confusing to, to clients, um, but the original work of authorship. And when the copyright arises is the moment that it's actually created and fixed in a tangible form. As you may know, registration has significant benefits, but it's not required. Um, where that's going to come into play is that upon a copyright being actually created, the law says that the creator owns that copyright uh, unless, number one, it was created within the scope of their employment and therefore it's just automatically owned by their employer, or two, you have a written agreement uh, to the contract, such as a work for hire agreement or an assignment assigning rights to a third party. Um, where that is going to become interesting in the, con in the context of virtual reality is to the extent that a user creates a copyrighted work that's not already some of the IP that the game platform owns, um, the user could own the copyright to it, not the game platform, because ownership arises at creation. Um, the Some terms of use out there for existing <clears throat> virtual reality services do specifically say, um, number one, that the users own the copyrights and the content they create. But then number two, they grant very broad licenses to, um, to the, the virtual reality service to reproduce, distribute, publish, display, you know, everything, um, the particular copyright of the user. Um, and also even include that they can use those copyrights to advertise and market the virtual reality, reality service. Um, I've seen on YouTube that there's some, you know, some interesting uh, Second Life commercials on YouTube for Second Life that have, you know, all sorts of activity and avatars and various things that were presumably created by some of the users. Um, and then the other interesting issue is it probably is likely that there will be disputes at some point over who really owns the copyrights and certain things. When you have users creating certain content such as avatars, but using code that's already there by the virtual reality service um, and other, other components. So I think it's fair to say that there probably is going to be litigation at some point over those points. Um, moving into issues of liability, <clears throat> copyright theories of liability. Um, also, copyright infringement is a strict liability tort, which is a pretty powerful thing. Um, there is direct infringement and then a variety of, of secondary theories, which are up here on the slide that I don't need to necessarily go through um, point by point. But also, uh, not only do you have liability if you just have no license whatsoever, but even going beyond the scope of a particular license that you might have been granted it also can give rise to liability. Um, so you want to make sure if you are representing clients in this area, you know, that you're drafting your licenses very carefully. Um, again, where some of these liability issues come into play in the virtual reality context 
is, um, for example, if someone creates uh, a, a copyrighted work, is the term, um, that is then on a virtual reality service, and that work, that content is hosted on the server uh, owned by the virtual reality company, um, most likely they will be held strictly liable for any copyright infringement that occurs. Um, and so everyone should consider best practices, including whether they should have a DMCA policy. And for anyone who's not familiar with that, um, Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, it's actually Section 512C, has a safe harbor from otherwise direct liability for content that is on your server if you comply with some very technical and specific requirements of 512 of the Copyright Act. Um, you, some people may know that uh, the movie industry spent years um, you know, litigating up and down and all over the place with YouTube over liability of YouTube for um, you know, a variety of infringing videos that are up on the service. And ultimately, the last, um, the last decision was that they, the uh, YouTube was not liable and that the, the studios had to continually send these DMCA notices to YouTube. Um, also, another area where it comes into play um, is if the content is not hosted. So if there is some content considered infringing, created by a user, um, but the virtual, virtual reality service is created in such a way that the content is not actually hosted on the service, um, that can create some other interesting issues, such as whether um, litigants would need to look at secondary theories of liability, because there may not be direct liability by virtue of hosting the service. Um, and there, the activity and all of the various statements and evidence of the actual virtual reality service would come into play. Um, I worked in the music industry during the Supreme Court Grokster decision um, where the issue was that the the peer-to-peer -peer music and file sharing was not hosted on Grokster's server. And so in that case, the Supreme Court actually created a new standard um, of inducement under copyright because we haven't had enough evidence that Grokster was inducing people to use their service for infringing, even though it was not going um, through the actual Grokster server. Uh, I think it's probably less likely that there would be sort of encouragement to infringe on virtual reality services than in the music world, but it is something to, to keep in mind. Um, another issue that is, is interesting in the copyright space is, um, let's say an avatar that's been created becomes wildly popular. Um, you know, it's something that becomes viral and, and you know, one particular uh, avatar is created that takes off. Um, let's say a brand or a movie uh, studio wants to adopt that and put it into some kind of commercial venture. Um, question would be, from whom do they license it? Um, will the virtuality service stick with their position if they have one in the terms of use that the user owns a copyright in that? Um, or how would the brand or the movie studio actually learn the identity of the creator if they wanted to approach them for a license? Um, they probably wouldn't subpoena them uh, to try to get their information, um, but how would that play out? Those are issues you might want to think through. Um, would they, uh, you know, would the, the service, the virtual reality service, once contacted by the studio or the brand, send an email to the user and say, hey, we've had this inquiry, you know, can I connect you with these people, that sort of thing. Um, other questions arise, and I'll try to move on quickly to trademarks. I'm not taking up too much time. Uh, other questions arise as far as uh, some of you may know that in order to uh, file a suit for copyright infringement, um, you need to have filed or actually have registered your copyright depending on the jurisdiction. Um, you also need to have filed your copyright application um, before the infringement in order to get certain damages, like statutory damages, attorney's fees. Some interesting issues are going to arise as far as who actually has the right to register those copyrights, the user or the virtual reality service. Um, moving on to trademarks, 
uh, a trademark, as you may know, is you know a, a, a word or a logo or a name or a symbol um, that serves to designate who the source of the goods are. Um, and for service, technically the word is service mark, but most people just call it a mark. Um, and brand, as you probably know, refers to the, the persona of a particular product or service that's been established by the marketing and advertising of that company. Moving on to the liability issues with regard to trademark, um, you know, most people are probably very familiar with the classic trademark infringement where someone comes out with another trademark that the original owner believes is likely to be confused with their trademark and is in a for goods that are either the same or related. Um, there's also less known uh, theories uh, such as false association endorsement or sponsorship, um, which can occur when a trademark owner or an individual believes that their name um, has been connected with a product or service in such a way that consumers are going to believe that they were sponsoring or affiliated or somehow um, otherwise connected to that particular product or service. And then dilution is another theory which can only be used by trademark owners who are deemed to have famous trademarks. Um, but it's a powerful tool because uh, dilution claims can arise on marks even when the goods are not competing and even when there's not necessarily a likelihood of confusion between the two marks. Um, there's two main, there's two types of dilution. One is blurring uh, when a trademark owner um, it's found that the trademark owner's mark is being weakened um, by the identification of its mark with dissimilar goods. And one example of blurring is there was a case about Kodak brand bicycles. In a normal classic trademark infringement case, bicycles and, and you know the goods that Kodak produces are sufficiently dissimilar, there wouldn't be a likelihood of confusion with classic trademark infringement claim. Um, but with A, a famous mark, and B, the blurring principle, Kodak did have a viable claim. Tarnishment is the second under dilution, um, which is using, is weakening the distinctiveness of the famous mark through inappropriate or unflattering associations. And there was a case, to give you an example, uh, where Toys R Us sued an adult website that used the name Adults R Us for a, pornogra a pornographic site, and that was a tarnishment case. Um, where this can come into play in virtual reality uh, is, again, the key takeaway here is that uh, a third party who uses another's mark for a commercial purpose, even if those goods are not competing with the trademark owner's goods, can still be subject of litigation. Um, the classic trademark infringement example that you, you, know, you probably already would think of would just be if the actual name of the virtual reality service is too similar to something that's, that's out there and there's a likelihood of confusion. For example, most people are probably familiar with Candy Crush, um, the video game. If someone came out with a virtual reality platform called Candy Rush, you know, that would be more of a classic trademark infringement claim. But what is more likely in the virtual reality context um, is the more successful that third parties become at repurposing popular marks for their digital commentary, the more concerned the brands are likely to become that the image of their brands are being diluted. Um, for example, uh, if a famous mark is being used, if, if the users are including famous marks uh, in these virtual reality games um, in ways that are distasteful to the brand owners. For example, using marks in graphically violent scenes or other undesirable uses. Um, some other issues to watch are who will the brand go after? Um, you know, it's not necessarily popular to go after individuals, um, so it's most likely the brand will be contacting the virtual reality service and wanting those, you know, offending uses of their trademarks to be taken down. Um, but what if the virtual reality service doesn't do that? Uh, they are the most likely target. So if, for anyone who represents any clients in this area, these are issues that you want to um, think through at the front end. Uh, another thing is, as most people are probably aware in social media, um, people are regularly trashing brands um, you know, in a variety of social media contexts. That's often not actionable because of First Amendment issues. Um, and it's often not the first step a brand wants to take to go after any consumers. 
Um, but what if competitors start finding virtual reality to be a good place um, with lots of eyes and lots of users to commercially disparage other brands? You know, that's certainly done on websites all the time, um, but sort of the next uh, logical place could be virtual, virtual reality platforms. Um, I will leave uh, my discussion with the false association and endorsement claims, um, which this you don't have to have a famous mark in order to bring a false association endorsement or sponsorship claim. Um, you could claim that, uh, you know, the the fact that your trademark is being used in a virtual reality service um, gives rise to the impression that your brand has some sort of endorsement or affiliation. Let's say there's a particular neighborhood that's been created um, in the, the virtual reality game. Um, individuals as well as um, which are often celebrities, are also able to bring 43A claims in addition to companies. Um, a related claim is the state right of publicity claim that Poe is about to discuss for individuals. Thanks, Linda. Um, so let's talk about right of publicity. What is right of publicity? It's, it's um, you know, we're talking about intellectual property rights, but when you're talking about intellectual property rights, even the right of publicity is not technically considered IP right, it is oftentimes combined with IP rights when, and when, when, um, when people are discussing li potential liability and, and rights clearance issues. So right of publicity is a right to control the commercial use of one's identity. This is based on state law, um, and, and, and there are a number of states, I believe there's 31 states currently, that either by statute or common law or a combination of the two recognize this right of publicity, the individual's right to control one's, um, the commercial use of one's identity. This right is really uh, applicable to individuals, not corporations. I think for corporations we have other protections like trademark. Um, one thing to note is that the right of publicity does not apply solely to celebrities. I think people think that right of publicity cases are really all about, you know, the Vanna Whites of this world or, or Michael Jordan, but it really isn't. The right of publicity does exist for non-celebrities like you and me, um, or e including employees of, of a company. Um, the basics of right of publicity is that state RP laws prohibit the use of a person's identity for commercial purposes without the person's consent. So if you want to use um, my name or picture in an ad for Domino's, um, their Domino's will have to come back and get my consent. In certain states, written consent is required. Um, New York requires written consent. Certain other states like California uh, do not require written consent. However, they extend the right of publicity rights to after the person has died. So there, it's called descendable postmortem rights. And, it, and in California, it can go up to 70 years after the person's death. And you can see with California, with uh, the protection of celebrities, how that is, why that um, law exists. How, the right of publicity is not really an absolute right, and, and there are, you always have to, um, you always have to, to weigh the right of publicity, right, the right of publicity uh, protection against First Amendment rights. Um, you, you don't want to be, you know, if we're talking about an artistic creation, like um, a movie that uh, portrays a, a, a real life figure, um, either a, 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 an existing figure today or a person who's died, um, like a docudrama, those things are protected by First Amendment. Um, so when courts are determining whether a use of a person's identity without the person's consent falls under, uh, uh, violates any right of public state, right of public statute, they have to always do the analysis as to whether there is a First Amendment exception that exists. So in other words, is there a commercial purpose here? If there's no commercial purpose, then the First Amendment would come right in and you would not, and, and the user, um, uh, the, the party using somebody else's, an individual's right of uh, name or likeness, would not be considered to have violated um, any right of publicity right. Uh, a perfect example of this is the Michael Jordan case that um, I'm not sure, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about this, this is big news, where um, uh, Michael Jordan sued 
um, uh, Dominique in, in Chicago against, uh, for, for use of his name um, for a congratulatory ad. And I think, the, I think that the first question that they had, they asked, um, and this was litigated over a number of years, is whether that kind of congratulatory ad is, um, or congratulatory message is, in fact, a commercial message. If it's not a commercial message, then the First Amendment trumps. If it is, um, then the right of publicity statutes apply. In the end, in that case, um, the court ruled that it's, it's a commercial message, and then, and then the jury subsequently, earlier this year, awarded Michael Jordan with an $8.9 million verdict. You can see how important and how, uh, uh, how, you know, how potentially huge the liability could be for somebody using an individual, especially a celebrity's right of, um, right of name or likeness without, without consent. Um, where this applies in, in, in uh, virtual reality, you can see that in virtual reality, if you were to, to use, um, and when I say you, I mean the virtual reality creators, the platform, or, or users, participants who are actually participating in the virtual reality world, if they were to use real life characters in the virtual reality world, then you really have to think about what the right of publicity um, laws apply. Uh, especially, this is especially true if that virtual reality world is sponsored by or is used to promote um, a brand. So if, um, uh, if McDonald's is sponsoring a virtual reality experience, then I think the, the most people would think the default, the most conservative way of thinking about it is, well, you have to really think about right of publicity issues because McDonald's is a brand. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, McDonald's does not have First Amendment protection or that right of publicity uh, laws automatically apply, but it is something to think about. So whenever brands are involved, then I think you have to be much more um, conservative about thinking about right of publicity statutes and, and liability under that. Um, there, the other thing to think about is there, with, with avatars, um, you know, if to the extent that you're really trying to imitate the real world in virtual reality, the, the question you have to ask is whether, is there, is it really, is the, is the, the product that's been created that uses somebody else's identity, is there, is that a created, does it fall under creative protection? Or, or is, is there a literal protect, your literal depiction of, of, an, of a, a live person that, um, that, that makes it, that really, uh, that weighs against um, the, the First Amendment right of sort of the artistic expression. Um, and, and that is something that we need to think about in, in virtual reality. Video games, um, for, for a number of reasons uh, in recent years, do not seem to be, or courts are more uh, hesitant to provide uh, the First Amendment protection to video games as opposed to movies. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, but it, it, it's relevant to think about in terms of virtual reality because you, when you wonder, is virtual reality more like video games or is virtual reality more like movies? Where docudramas, typically you can portray people without thinking too much about, um, about liability unless you know, you're, you're falsely portraying a person. But in video games, um, as we know, there have been a lot more <laughs> litigation on this and, and I think video game companies have, by and large, lost that battle. What we're going to do is um, in the next, the remainder of this kind of presentation, we're going to go through some case studies that will hopefully, um, that we can use to really apply these principles, whether it's right of publicity, um, copyright, trademark, and patent principles that we just discussed um, in, the, in, in the context of virtual reality scenarios. So with that, I will go into the discussion of the first case study. So case study number one, um, a company, a startup company, tech startup company called MediaNow has launched a new virtual reality platform where participants live in an alternate universe, Realton. In Realton, participants can be whoever they want, their own unique avatars or pop culture characters. There are no fees to participate but users can purchase tools from MediaNow for use in real time, kind of like the freemium games you know about today. A 12-year-old user, Sheldon, has created an avatar in real time that he has named Neo. Neo is a very popular name in virtual reality. In 
case you didn't know. Neo wears a long black coat and has dark hair, but his hair is long and curly and he wears a red bandana. Media Now has received a cease and desist letter from the studio that produced The Matrix and from Keanu Reeves' lawyers. Although Media Now is thrilled that Realton is attracting attention, they don't want lawsuits so early in the game. So Linda, um, let me point the question to you first. Sure. Does the studio have a valid claim? And if they do, what claims do they have against Media Now? and against perhaps the user, Sheldon, who created the avatar called Neo. Okay. Uh, the, this doesn't strike me as perhaps the strongest claim that I've ever seen, but uh, characters are commonly protected by studios under trademark and copyright law because of the, the massive licensing and merchandising rights that they, they can have. Um, there's been several cases holding that studios have rights to ET, for example, is just one. Um, the question here would be, um, under copyright law, you know, is this guy substantially similar to any rights that the studio does have in the character Neo from The Matrix. Um, you know, secondly, it would really depend on the use um, of, of this character. You know, is it some sort of parody? Um, is it some other kind of fair use or commentary? So I think, um, you know, the particular facts that are at play and how it looks would be relevant here. Um, there's also potentially a false endorsement claim um, for having such a character in a commercial product. Um, as far as uh, if, I think you said, if Media Now would have any claims against NEO, um, you know, there may be a breach of the terms of use. Uh, depending on what, you know, what the particular terms of use said, um, you know, he may have, which is often the case, he may have indemnified them uh, to the extent that media now finds themselves having any claims. Um, you know, I question, of course, you know, who really wants to be in some sort of litigation with a 12-year-old, <laughs> but, you know, the, the issues apply also with adults as well. I think it's interesting that, um, and in, the, in this fact pattern, uh, and I, I, I'm assuming that most people watch The Matrix and are very familiar with what Neo looked like, but um, Sheldon's avatar doesn't strike me as being literally similar or even, you know, incredibly similar to, to, the, Mat to the Matrix character Neo. Dark hair, yes. Long black coat, yes. Um, his hair is long, and Neo's hair was really short. Uh, he never wore a red bandana. So you wonder, in this case, um, whether there is enough similarity to really, um, and cert certainly uh, whether the similarity is enough to, to, to sustain a claim. Uh, and I think that's true from a writer publicity perspective. Um, I don't know what claim Keanu Reeves' uh, lawyers would have because it doesn't look like Neo looks anything like Keanu Reeves, other than the fact that there is some uh, similarities between well, there's the name and and you know there, there there's no write up of a claim against a character from a movie, um, it's just because it sort of seems to um, uh, imply that we're talking about Keanu Reeves doesn't necessarily give him um, a sustainable write up publicity claim. So let me let me just uh, move further and ask a follow up question. If the student, and Linda, I think this is similar to what you alluded to during your discussion of uh, copyright. In the event the studio is really interested in using the character Neo and the storyline that was created for a Matrix sequel. So remember this virtual reality world where Sheldon or Neo uh, is living in this world and cre creating different storylines um, that may be similar or not so similar to the Matrix. There is, there is content that's being created. And let's say the studio who owns the Matrix um, is really interested in taking some of that content and incorporating that into, um, into the, the, the sequel. Or maybe they even like the avatar. In fact, they want to incorporate the avatar. What would you say to that? 
Uh, I would say it would create very interesting issues, number one, as to who might actually own the rights to to the avatar and the storyline. You know, it could be more than Sheldon. Uh, it could be other users. Uh, it could be the VR platform if they're providing parts thereof. Uh, you know, if, if it's an entire storyline that's been, pre been created by multiple players, and that might be governed by the terms of use. Um, what I think uh, is sort of the more practical issue here is my my instinct is that the studio would probably take the position that if they really wanted to use this um, in you know in a movie that the avatar was um, a derivative work that he um, Sheldon didn't actually have their authorization to create and they you know might handle it that way <laughs> with more of um, of coming on the offense as far as um, he didn't have these rights in the first place, so that in order to handle this, there should be a deal struck in order to um, make sure that it's abundantly clear that they can then use this in their next movie. Thank you for that. Um, I think there are a lot more discussions we can have based on this case study, but given that we have limited time, we're going to move on to the, the next case study. You can, you can see that there are always a lot of issues, and all, all these issues are probably waiting to be litigated at some point in the future. Um, so, so, Justin, do you want to take us through your case study, too? We'll do that. Thank you, Pope. Good uh, case study. So as we move to case study two, uh, you'll see that we've got a scenario here where we're dealing with a startup in the, let's say, virtual gaming uh, area. And I'll read case study to, uh, to you here. So, we've got an entrepreneur, an avid gamer here, who decides to create a new gaming center, which is designed to offer an immersive virtual reality experience in a large space that makes gamers feel as if they're literally within a video game. The center inhabits a huge warehouse that contains hundreds of the latest ABC cameras. ABC is a major provider in this scenario of video gaming systems that use cameras to watch and track the motion of users. Um, players can strap on a padded backpack that contains a DEF computer. In this scenario, the DEF computer is a major provider of high-performance gaming PCs. And the players can then don headsets from GHI, uh, VR headsets in order to blast oncoming waves of virtual zombies in this particular game. The DEF computers that are in the uh, backpacks render the virtual environment for the player's headsets. The game consists of a one-hour experience for multiple players. Sales of gaming appointments exceed expectations, and within two weeks of opening, the center is uh, booked up. They're signing people on for about 1,000 per, 100 per person. So due to the demand, Entrepreneur naturally is excited, begins building pretty quickly a new gaming center and has visions of either franchising or making a chain of these game stores around the country, starts ordering hundreds more of the latest cameras from ABC, computers from DEF, and headsets from GHI. They then get a letter from patent licensing company PLC in the mail stating that new gaming centers' use of these cameras, computers, and headsets infringes their patents. PLC threatens an injunction and litigation against the entrepreneur and his company, New Gaming Center, if they do not license their patent and pay an annual royalty of 10% of the net revenue generated from their use of, of this equipment and use of this system. The entrepreneur has never, of course, heard of PLC and has not heard of this patent that's being asserted. Bewildered and confused, he can contacts, ABC, DEF, and GHI. So in this and in the interest of time, what does the entrepreneur do? What, you know, what's a, a business person faced with this kind of situation do uh, it, even today uh, where this kind of technology is available and constantly being innovated and he is taking uh, elements of what's out there to create this immersive experience from people um, and trying to figure out how to leverage it in the real world. So one thing that comes up right off the bat um, in this particular instance, and in the current construct that we live in with uh, patent litigation, is one tool that hasn't been out there for, for many years, and this is post-America Invents Acts, is you have the capability 
to use post-grant proceedings, IPR proceedings, as a matter of fact. One thing this particular entrepreneur could do, uh, if possible, once getting a, an IP or patent counsel involved, instead of firing back with litigation, uh, looking at submitting what's called the inter partes review. And quite, simp quite simply, this is something where you are able to uh, submit without necessarily going to litigation to the PTAB, the patent uh, at the USPTA, USPTO, where you can hopefully invalidate patents that are being asserted against you in litigation. In many cases, the litigation that may be threatened against you can actually get stayed, and it's certainly the kind of thing that will put an entrepreneur in a better bargaining position against a company like this for eventual talks um, about licensing or any royalty payments. Quite simply, it's a way to invalidate uh, patent claims that are being asserted against you if they turn out to be uh, unpatentable uh, in the law. Now, how could that happen? We could go in this particular case, and I can give a couple scenarios where that are based on real life. Very recently, uh, there was a case involving, this is actually a PTAB IPR proceeding involving video gaming companies, a company called Ubisoft that many of you who may be in the video gaming industry know, filed against a patent licensing company by the name of Princeton Digital. In that case, the technology at issue uh, actually dealt with some of the games that people play for uh, music, for your uh, pretending you're a rock star, you're controlling a certain environment based on how you play and input uh, uh, audio signals into a music system. The particular patents that were being asserted against uh, Ubisoft, particular patent claims in that case, were actually invalidated as a part of the IPR proceeding, mainly because they were unpatentable in view of previous prior art and in view of the fact that some of the claim limitations didn't have support in the specification. Quite simply, what we could do in this particular case and what this particular entrepreneur could do is point out various instances of how this type of technology has already existed in the market and how it may predate, in terms of priority, the patents being asserted against him. Another angle here from a more practical standpoint is simply go to uh, companies ABC, DEF, and GHA for indemnification support. Ostensibly, he's already become a pretty big customer of theirs. It's in those particular companies' interests to continue working and selling to the new gaming center and maybe its growing business model. There's going to be huge economic incentive there to indemnify and perhaps support or even join in in litigation uh, to support this particular uh, entrepreneur because this is something in terms of a business model that, if successful, uh, would generate a lot of business for the supplying companies who provide different elements. Another, quite frankly, uh, honest thing that the person could do here is really, when they get an attorney, assess the patent claims asserted against them. What we see today, particularly in the context of software patents and patents that are basically about methods or certain uh, processes, there are a lot of ways to invalidate or challenge those types of patents. One may be the kind of scenario where the patent is very broad and it essentially tries to assert that it is invented or that it's a patent covering a system for controlling a virtual environment uh, by input of users' movements. And it could be just something that broad, whereby that's an abstract concept and that's the kind of thing that under some of the more recent case law for instance, the Alice case, which many of you in the patent practice know about, has done a good job of sort of raising the bar and knocking out a lot of what I would call abstract software patents, and certainly has been helpful in certain companies' defense against patent licensing companies or some that people would pejoratively call patent trolls. In this scenario, again, that's the type of option that perhaps uh, this entrepreneur could raise it as a defense. One other quick question in the interest of time, because we're getting low on it, that I would bring up, is there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different flexibility in terms of how one might render uh, and display images to players in a virtual environment. In this scenario here, we've got people donning headsets. But let's say this entrepreneur is quick and then realizes that, you know what, I'm going to be facing bigger liability if I keep on with further gaming systems. Let me go with an alternative provider and instead of headsets, I've got a better idea. Uh, I've got people I know at this particular company, XYZ, 
who sells holographic projectors. And instead of having people don on headsets, I can have holographic projectors integrated at different points within our gaming system and then have that uh, take input from the motion sensors and tracking in the cameras and project images to players as they engage with the game that way so that they're not necessarily looking at it through a heads-up display. The question then there becomes, is that enough of either design around or a system now that doesn't infringe the patent being asserted against them? Classic answer is it depends on the patent claims, but in this scenario, it probably would be enough to perhaps get around the particular patent claim being asserted against them. So a lot of issues here, a lot of things to think about, both on a practical level and in terms of just how do you maneuver around patent law uh, in a virtual world environment. But uh, happy to deal with questions with this after as we move now to case study three. Thanks, Justin. Um, we're going to try to do this really um, quickly because we're running low on time. We only have five minutes left. Um, the third case study is uh, related to the Olympics. Apex Airline is one of the main sponsors of the 2016 Summer Olympics. These are all, by the way, um, scenarios and, and it's not based on facts. As part of their marketing campaign in connection with the Olympics, they are sponsoring a real-time VR experience where users can join their favorite athletes during an Olympic event uh, and activity. Apex does not have individual endorsement agreements with any of the athletes that can be used in the VR experience, but is merely licensing content from the Olympics. Sprinter Milo Phipps gets upset when he finds out that he is being featured in a VR experience sponsored by Apex Airlines. His uniform sponsor, Singlet Inc., is also upset because Milo Phipps has an exclusive deal with the Singlet Inc. Um, across all platforms and paid him to be their exclusive spokesperson. Another Olympic sponsor, whose signage appears in the VR experience, is thrilled with the free advertising. This raises a lot of interesting issues, and I think um, more and more we're starting to see brands getting involved in creating VR experiences to to um, raise their brand profile um, and also to um, to activate, uh, do marketing activations around sponsorships that they have. This is a perfect example of where we have a major sponsor of the Olympics. They have the permission from the Olympics to, um, to do an activation, presumably with their consent um, on this particular activation. So the false association issue that we talked about earlier uh, with Linda, as, as far as Olympics go, that, that's not an issue. The question rises with respect to Milo Phipps. Milo Phipps is an individual, um, he's an individual athlete. And, and you can imagine how this is going to happen. You, the Olympics or, or Apex Airline probably has these VR cameras that are stationed at various Olympic events, whether it's a the opening ceremony, um, a medal, um, uh, at the medal stand, or, or during an actual, um, uh, your actual um, athletic event. And the camera angle, camera is capturing everything and, and streaming that experience to, um, to where Air, Apex Airlines has set up a marketing booth and, and somebody wearing a, a VR um, um, eye headgear whether, they, whether they're eyeglasses, it could be from lots of different companies, um, can experience being part of that, that part of the Olympics. So I could be wearing this headgear, and I am look, I'm watching myself be walking next to my, uh, Milo Phipps. Um, so, so in that case, you know, Milo Phipps, who does not have an agreement with Apex Airline, has an exclusive agreement with um, with. Uh, Singlet, who probably you know paid a lot of money for for Milo Phipps to be exclusive to them, he is um, he's part of an experience that is sponsored by Apex Airlines. What happens? Um, I think this is and I, and I raise a question and, and I want to answer uh, ask a question to both Linda and and um, Justin. But my guess is in this case. Milo Phipps probably doesn't really have a, a claim against um, the Apex Airline, as long as you're not really taking a picture of Milo Phipps um, and, and the user who's using it and putting it in social media where, you can, where it looks like there's something more being done 
with the VR experience and, and just then just experiencing it during the during the Olympics. So, uh, Justin and Linda, do you have any other thoughts on that? I would. Uh, um, I, I I see I see what you're saying. I see your analysis. But on the flip side, I could certainly envision a case being brought, um, you know, <laughs> with violation of right of publicity and a 43A claim, sort of with the the general um, point that Apex is getting eyes on their campaign, you know, by using his likeness in a certain manner. So. Um, I think that is is some potentially dangerous territory. Whether you know whether they would win or not is an open question. And right, I think I, I'd, I'd agree too. Yeah, I was going to say I agree too, and I think what you'd end up with is some sort of scenario where the uh, uh, the, the, the sprinter here is going to be looking for some sort of some sort of remuneration, whether that's going to be successful or not. And uh, it, it would have to be resolved probably with some sort of settlement after the, the filing of the suit. Now, whether it would be successful in the merits, that's another question. But certainly... Right. Or, right. And, and Justin, I think you're right. But I think, I, I think in, in this case, we, we, don't, we haven't seen this happen. You know, when you, when you have um, uh, NBC taking the Olympic footage and, 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 and streaming it to people, and, and there are sponsors or particular elements of that, um, they don't necessarily have to go get specific consent from individual athletes. However, I wonder the way to resolve this issue is perhaps um, to uh, to make the agreement that Apex uh, um, and the and the Olympics and would would the USOC and the IOC um, to more broadly include this type of scenario. Um, I, I doubt that those agreements currently contain any contemplation of this whatsoever, but it's, it's something that could happen. And it would be probably impossible for, for Apex Airline to go and get consent from every single athlete simply because um, there's way too many athletes. And I think the, the whole idea of this is that it's instead of looking at it 2D or even 3D, you're just looking at it from a VR experience perspective, uh, but I'm, but I like like Justin and Linda said, th this is probably an issue that will um, will need to be figured out in the future when this becomes a reality. Um, with that, I'm going to close our official presentation. And um, Rhonda, are there a couple of questions? I know that we're going over, but I think we can we can maybe answer a couple of questions before we do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the very informative presentation today. We'll have uh, time for one question, and uh, and then what we will do is uh, invite all of the attendees, if they have any questions, to email uh, Poe, Justin, and Linda directly if they want more follow-up and more robust discussion around uh, the topics. So the question is in regards to the first case study. And it is, what can we do in terms of service and other best practices, such as training of internal employees, uh, do to best insulate our clients from the issues uh, that were raised in the case study? And I'll throw that out to any, either, any of you that want to answer that. Poe, do you want me to? Take that. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. You you can answer, or I'll jump in as well. I think this okay. this is um, one of the things we want to talk about is user terms, which I think you actually mentioned during your um, part of the presentation as well. Yeah, I mean, I think this we could probably spend 45 minutes on this answer alone, and I'm assuming that most people need to hop for lunch. <laughs> so, you know, sort of key points. Obviously, this can't be exhaustive. Is the terms of use are really critical as far as who owns what content um, and how that will work. Uh, indemnifications are important. Uh, you need to think about how your platform is designed, meaning is there, are things going to be hosted on your server or not. Um, to the extent they are, uh, we would recommend that you um, become familiar to the extent you're not already with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Safe Harbor. Um, have a policy, make sure that the um, internal employees on the front lines are educated. Uh, there was a case, there's a, been some litigation, you know, for the last couple of years with the Beastie Boys and Monster Energy 
And one of the big things that the um, court hung their hat on was just that they didn't believe that the um, employees within Monster Energy were appropriately uh, trained and had an appropriate uh, sort of clearance and compliance program. So that sort of stuff does matter sometimes in the evidence. I, I think as a final note, uh, we should all remember that that there is a there are some precedents in, in dealing with BR issues, which is really, or especially in the user-generated content uh, space, which is the current platforms, current current social media platforms that exist today. Um, I think a lot of these issues have been um, have have been analyzed and in some cases litigated. So I think uh, looking at the current platforms is a good indication of how we should perhaps approach these issues in connection with, with virtual reality. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and, and Rhonda, do you wanna just close this out or is that yes. all? Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our speakers, Co, Justin and Linda for being with us today. And I'd also like to thank our audience for attending today's presentation. Again, if you would like to pose any more questions to Poe, Justin, or Linda, uh, their email addresses are on the screen here, and they will be in the presentation that you're able to download. So thank you all for attending, and have a wonderful day. Thanks.